All right, so Greg, uh, top of the hour. Go ahead, Lenny. Greg, do you have the? Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of stuff for managing the queue. Do you I have can manage that? the queue. Yes, I can manage the All queue. Right. All right, you got that one. And I can carry chat over to the queue as well. However, what we Great. do need is a note taker, someone taking minutes. Look at all the volunteers. I see eye contact. You think I'm taking, taking notes? Oh, that's <laughs> brilliant. Anybody? How about the next person that walks through the door gets assigned the note taker? <laughs> I like you were going to go back in and pass through the door for us, but no, you quit. This is where I, I hurt people and assign them. You know what? I bought your fries last night. You're yeah, taking notes. Can mighty convenient. Oh, you're coming to his bed. Doesn't matter, but he didn't have any tools. He, yeah, he played that on, game. Like... Someone, anyone, please. We can't move without this. It's a great way to kind of keep you awake, keep me awake. Stig. <laughs> I'll do Pim for you next time. He was a bit sleepy at lunchtime. And Pim's harder. This is an easy day. Yeah. Okay. okay, and I owe you a Pim, I promise. It's amazing how quiet and really yeah. oh. oh, everyone's head goes down, you know, like no eye contact. That's when you get eye contact, like, I'm leaving. You can't assign me. <laughs> Jeez. It wasn't slight about that. It's head jacked to Thank you, Sig. I owe you. Actually, but the nice part about Tim's going to pay you back for me because I bought him his fries. Did you really? Who's counting? <laughs> All right, Lenny, you going to start or you want me to head out? Uh, why don't you start and cover the, the, the meat well and the meat right. notes? Sorry, no, but well. I okay. You got slide control. So, welcome to MOD. You guys in the right place, right time. I love all the engagement. It's great, you know, being the first session in the morning as early as this is. I understand why everyone's still asleep. <laughs> hey, I was at back at two a.m. again. This is the morning, <laughs> and I'm hammered. All right, note well, note well. The next noted more. Next slide. Note really well, really, really well. All right, and again, tips. That's kind of interesting. You can get the tips if you can open the deck, but you can't open the deck unless you know the tips. That's cool. Okay, that's for remote participation, how to put your hand in the queue, how to mute yourself, all those important things. All right. Also, also just to add, uh, even the folks in the room, please join. Uh, you, you can join um, because we're going to manage the queue using this, uh, uh, using the tool. That way, um, there's a fairness between remote participants and participants in yeah. the room. Good point. Thanks. We we broke that rule in PIM yesterday and just started storming the mic. Sorry. We need to sign in to make sure we get a bigger room. That's true too. With the with the blue sheet kind of goes across your lap. It's an easy thing to just squiggle and move on. But this requires you to actually bust out your phone and take a picture, log in. Oh, really? <laughs> All right. Um, so here is. On the front, one on the back, and then 
So we've got the agenda for today posted. It's uh, it's a light agenda. We do have a little bit of room um, if anyone uh, for, for last minute, uh, uh, if anybody has anything else they'd like to add, but um, uh, any bashes to this agenda? Okay, moving right along. All right, in terms of uh, active working group documents, um, there is the telemetry document uh, that since 117 um, that did pass working group last call um, successfully. Uh, at this point, we are seeking a document shepherd uh, for that. So um, if you would like to participate in the process. Um, Who has never sh shepherded a document? No, take it back. Who has shepherded a document? Who has actually shepherded a document? Any group doesn't matter. It's the process. I mean, because what I how I try to sell it is, if you're relatively new, shepherding is a good way to kind of figure out the whole process, what the expectations are, you know, the queue structure and the people involved. So, I recommend it all the time to jump in. Looks like a bunch of you haven't. So, uh, you know, we can't assign people to do it necessarily, but we do need participation. And if you're on the list and you're attending groups, you want to see this work move forward. That's an easy way to to help out, and we need it. So please, Shepard, volunteer. There's more coming up too, all the time. I believe some of the people are also appointing chair, you know, like if you appoint chair, it's like a new shepherd group, or if you're ever considering becoming a chair of a working group, having shepherded some documents is a good sign. Nice. Yes, exactly. So if, uh, if you're thinking about it and a little nervous, feel free to reach out to um, Greg or me uh, offline and we can, um, uh, explain to you what uh, shepherding actually means and what uh, level of commitment it is. It's not too bad and it's fun. All right. Um, the Yang models uh, draft. Um, any updates to this is, uh, is Sandy or any of the authors of that draft uh, on and want to um, mention any uh, updates to that? Thank you, ZTE. Um, about the multicast young model, we just received some comments from Tom, so we will uh, update a new version according to his comments. And about the redundant ingress failover, we think that it's ready for working group last call. Yeah. Okay. And the Yang model. Um, I forget. Sandy, are you an are you a co-author on that one? Any of the co-authors on the Yang model or uh, AMT Yang models draft yes. have any updates? I, I, I'm Ethan Liu. Uh, I'm the co-author of the AMT Yang model. And uh, okay. last last IGTF, uh, the, uh, the the draft has uh, just uh, adopted, and uh, we need more uh, review and the comments for the for the for the draft. Uh, thank you. Great. All right. Um, other drafts, uh, the Jeff, uh, uh, Jake had uh, the um, his uh, the uh, multicast to the browser drafts, um, and Max, um, do you want to share an update with uh, for what's going on with these drafts? They're sure. All expired. Uh, Max Max Franke, TU Berlin. Um, so we talked to Jake. Um, and the idea is to move the first three of those, so MBC back and DOMS at least forward. Kyle will take over MB and I will take over C back and DOMS. Um, the thing with DOMS is, thank you. <laughs> the thing with thank DOMS you. is we had, uh, or Jake at least had called for working group last call a couple of times, but there was no really response too much to that. So I'm not sure what to do with that now. Um, but yeah, I, I think DOMS at least is in a state it could go to working group last call. I guess we can sort out the, the handing over first and then ask again, maybe at next ITF, but yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. Also, I would be happy to shepherd uh, the telemetry draft as well. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Okay. Um, Max is so far Other our problem. favorite member of this working group right now. All right, uh, so uh, Max? Come on up, you're, you're next uh, to cover, um, to give us an update on the multicast quick draft. All right. 
Do you drive this night? Or... I can't. Just, Would you like me to? Hot. But the yeah, camera, is that supposed to be automatically turning, or we have to turn that to look at him? It's staring at me. Uh, is there another one? It's fine. It looks like it's motorized, but here you go. So it's probably going to make me head like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and higher. This is yeah, yeah. It's a little twisted here. You can pull the shaft. Yeah, yeah it goes straight. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody tell me when this is good. Perfect. Yeah, looks good. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, so hi, I'm Max again. Um, so this is an update for the, the multicast extension to Quick that we introduced at the, in Philadelphia last year. Jake, unfortunately, as with his drafts, has no more, not much time anymore to work on this, but um, Louis from UC Louvain um, is there, was going to talk a bit about FEC in a moment, um, has an implementation, and we are trying to work on it this way and move it forward with, with Lucas and uh, Kyle as well. So next slide. So I'm just going to give uh, a really quick recap again of recap again of, of what the draft is about because people might have forgotten since then. Um, and then what has changed since the last time we presented the current state and about implementations and some open questions we have and how to proceed from here. Okay, next slide. So to really to recap quickly, the idea is to combine a normal quick connection, so unicast connection with multicast. And um, first you establish the, the normal quick connection where you have your cryptography and everything to secure it. And then after that, in the same vein as multipath quick in a way, you, you open a, another path um, or you, you can use another path. The server sends the client information about some available multicast channels they could join to to receive data over, over multicast. The point here is that it's more or less transparent to the client, so to the application layer, whether or not after it has enabled um, multicast support. So set a flag that it allows multicast um, transmission, that it's transparent to the client, whether or not the, the packets came over the multicast channel or over the unicast connection. And that is to, to an, um, enable you know fallback in case the multicast doesn't work you, it will just be sent over unicast so the applications don't have to worry about um, making uh, some alternative arrangements there okay so after having joined and there's you can have multiple channels so you can combine channels you can have um, different channels with different qualities for example if you think about video streaming you could have one channel that supplies the, the video in 720p and one in 1080p and then depending on the capabilities the, the client has, the client negotiates these capabilities to the server. Um, it can, the, the server instruct the, the, the client to join the appropriate channels to get you know, the most of, out of its available bandwidth. Um, this multicast traffic is secured thanks to the unicast connection against injections from third parties by um, you know, having integrity to, to all the packets on, that are sent over multicast. The multicast channel is also encrypted of course, since it's multicast, all receivers have the same keys. So as if one of them leaks it, it's no longer really that secure. But the idea here is that's mostly for traffic anyway. That's not that, not that um, important to be encrypted. Um, right. Yeah, sure. Dino? Is it okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah Dino, fine. please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so a bunch of quick questions. If you want to rekey, could you rekey over the... Before you use it on the multicast channel, you just tell everybody unicast what the new key is. is yes. That how it's done? Okay. Yes. So the, the idea is for the keys is so of course you have different uh, crypto contexts for the unicast and for each channel as well. Okay. And you can either um, you, you you can change the keys over multicast, but you should of course do it periodically over unicast as well to to make sure that you know that somebody who's no longer connected to unicast at all gets kicked out at some point. Right? Okay. So, and if 50% um, of the recipients don't act, do you retransmit as multicast or unicast? That's okay. So we, we have open questions about how to handle um, retransmissions and so on. We, we now um, had an added fact to, to, um, to, to it and there's different approaches on handling okay. it. But the, the basic idea is that you don't specify it in the draft how exactly to do retransmission because in the end that's up to the server if it detects, you know. There's a general issue with multicast somewhere, then it's probably better to transmit over unicast even if it's more costly. But if, you know, if 
this uh, Multicast in general seems to be fine. It's actually lost packets somewhere, then it's probably better to transmit over Multicast. Because we've been trying to do reliable multicast mm -hmm. for 20 years. Yes. And I think this is the best combination that has ever come up, mm -hmm. yeah. right? E even though there, we can argue that there might be ACK implosion. But would you consider this proposal a yet another reliable transport multicast? Yes? Uh, There's a shaking head here. Uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Torless, one more question. And, and just, uh, just a reminder for everyone, Tor Torless and Luis have, uh, uh, have been uh, entered the queue. Um, anybody else who wants to join, please do join. A enter the queue um, with the Meet Echo tool. Don't answer the question whether this is RMT or not. It's a rat hole. Just do the technology. Um, <laughs> The, did you did you think about NAC? I mean, maybe it's not really a NAC, but something like I think I'm hitting congestion window slow down to identify the slowest receiver or something, but to, to get more scalability in there, maybe coming not first round and maybe an extension, but obviously that, that would make it, I think, a lot more attractive uh, at scale. Yes, thank you. That's a, that's a really good suggestion. Th that's actually, Louis, that's actually exactly one of the points that are going to come up is that we are debating in if to do NEC or not. Um, we get another queue. Yes, Louis. One. Yes, so Louis Navarre from UC uh, also in the draft. So just to add some comments, but I don't know if it's better that I do the comments now or when I sure, come no, down right, the stage. No, but yeah. yeah, so that's something like we're discussing uh, positive or negative ag acknowledgements. Um, and the use of FEC. So for example, now I've been working a bit on the implementation and basically the idea was to use FEC um, until, so, uh, until some point. Um, and when, for example, you have a client that is really a bottleneck and that's lost a lot of packets, you can just say, okay, now we retransmit the, the data through Unicast for this client. And if, it's, if the client stays really like uh, a bottleneck, we can kick it, kick it out of the multicast channel. And we'll continue using Unicast. So, yeah. yeah, so that's the idea of using multipass, but we'll explain it a, a bit later. But that's the idea of using multipass because now the client can just switch to Unicast very easily. Lucas? Next queue, Lucas. Hey, Lucas Pardue, uh, Clive Flair, uh, co chair of the Quick Working Group, nominally named on the draft, but I haven't been able to pay much attention to it for ages. So, I've been able to meet up with Max and Lewis this, like, this IETF and kind of refresh myself with this stuff. Um, it, it is reliable um, for various reasons, but the, the acking of each packet doesn't necessarily mean you're sending an ACK per packet. So in the quick working group, we're looking at various extensions. The, the draft itself says ACK every other packet, uh, but that you can do things like ACK frequency and negotiate or tune these for different endpoints. So I think there's a lot of flexibility to help avoid some of the scalability challenges and that this is the thing that Quick is good at is providing extensibility. The real power become, comes from effectively the connection is independent of the paths over which data is being delivered. There are, there are real practical considerations you need to make, but this design compared to something I worked on years ago is a lot cleaner because it, it handles this stuff as a transport service rather than trying to tack on other things or stitch other protocols together. Thanks. Next. Hi, Matthias, uh, just an editorial question. This is all about SSM, right, and not ASM. Yes. So I think the draft title should reflect this. It's currently talking about multicast over quick, yeah. but it's only so specific multicast over quick. Yeah. In the draft, you say, right, at the I know, very I know but yeah, the okay. title should also make it really clear. Ah, okay, okay, sure. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks. It doesn't have to require SSM, right? I mean, it gets a lot harder if you also allow ASM, right? If, sorry? if you allow ASM, it gets way harder to do. So, From if, the transport yes. Why? Well, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, there was the source, right? Yeah. It's because you have the connections between all the clients and the server. So now if you have multiple sources, you have to, for all the clients to have a connection with all the sources. So you have, you have to have this mapping between the source, each source and all the clients. So you have to have like a lot of connections everywhere if you want to support multiple sources yeah, at the same time. Yeah, yeah oh. but if the application wants to Everybody. Oh. On multicast, you're saying the N squared unicast connections is a bad thing. Well, also for the use cases we had in mind, and since ASM is depreciated for, for interdomain, right? Um, for the use case we had in mind initially. It, whiteboard. What if I want to do whiteboard? Sure, but the, it's, it's, it's very complicated, and I think there's a lot of things to consider right now. So we 
initially for the ASM, having ASM maybe as an extension later and what you need to change. But for the, at the beginning saying ASM is like out of scope for now is better. Of course, we can talk about including it. Maybe it's not that much work, but we see. Yeah. I'm sticking myself in the queue. Yeah. Go ahead, Toshi. I'm, I, I'm in behind Toshi. Oh, uh, <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, I'd like to just ask you about the uh, uh, client. Act. So does this act include the some mechanism for the late control or something like a RTCP because it reminds me the RTCP. Um, so it's a different. Yeah, no, it's normal quick X. It's so. I know this is yeah. not a RTCP, but uh, yeah. just uh, so ACU is just uh, uh, indicate the packet loss or. Yes, so yes. Is there any uh, function to change the late and so on? There is um, no such kind of uh, function. Not for now, no. Okay. Yeah, but we can consider it. Yeah. Okay. Does Jeff, me, just want to comment about that, Dino. Um, the, the truth is multicast has always had to know what's going on in the, in the network. It's kind of been that anomaly. And the assumption that ASM means that you have ASM functionality in the app and or the network, they aren't necessarily correlated in that I can have a many, many application that has out of bounds so source discovery and I don't have to care about it within the infrastructure. And there right away, my application has to know what the network is or isn't doing. So, um, what we're doing when, the, when, when you're we're requesting ASM within the protocol, what you're really requesting is not many to many, you're requesting network-based source discovery. And that doesn't have to happen in the network to still get ASM functionality in the application. Okay, there, off my soapbox. <laughs> but I got a queue of them back here, so careful. <laughs> okay, um, next slide. Yeah. Right, okay, so we've been over this, I think, uh, enough, the, the things itself. Um, right, so yeah, you have a, you have still have some unicast traffic, so you have some scalability issues, but you offload the data to, to the multicast and get like, we calculated like a 35, with the, the current approach we have integrity frames, you get like a 35 uh, times increase in, in, you know, throughput capacity. Okay, uh, next slide. Right, so um, since the last time we presented, we have we made a lot of um, improvements, additions to the draft. Again, it slowed down a bit when, when we lost Jake, unfortunately. Um, that's all wrong. Um, we got a good and long review from Martin Duke. Thanks for that. Um, and have incorporated most of the changes. Right, so also since Multipath Quick is kind of getting finalized at the Quick Working Group, we now want to make more clear how it interacts with that and how exactly we use the second path and so on. So be able to carry as much from there over to here as possible. Yes, Toshi. Uh, does this uh, draft include the consideration about the media over Quick because uh, Mock has been discussing a lot. So. So yes. Is there any relation about the mock? Um, we we talked to Lucas Curley, right? Um, Luke Curley, sorry. Um, uh, last year as well, and yes, we we have we have mock in, in we 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 see what mock is doing, and we we uh, take that into consideration as well. That it's a bit different, I would say, different. right? Yes, Lucas. Okay. I think Lucas, you can just. Can I yeah, answer that maybe just to, yeah. to, to say very quickly. Yeah, effectively, you need to think of Quick as providing services to applications. So the only things that applications care about is reliable streams or unreliable datagrams right now. And that's a big discussion in Mock. Do you, do you they want to transfer their video or their media or whatever over these different kinds of application vessels? Uh, this abstracts it away. You know, you, it, the, the layering here is correct, which is it, it means people can just do stuff. Obviously. When it comes to configuration and how you would set up a service to do this stuff, there's a lot more discussion, but I see that as kind of out of band things that will come later on. So, I said, uh, Arcus, uh, so I've not read the draft, so maybe this is a stupid question. Can but you I just... wait one second? Uh... Right. Right. No, I didn't read the draft. Yeah. So yeah. Apologize for that, but I would have thought maybe you put it into your introduction. but. Do I understand correctly that the replication of the multicast packet is only at the server? Uh, the replication? No, it's on, on path, right? It's regular multicast. The router is the, the, the replicant, the, the packet. Or maybe but I then understand. the router doesn't support quick. 
No, no, it's no. the it's yeah. UDP. It's normal UDP. Uh, Quick is using UDP, right? So it's normal UDP packets for, for the routers. Okay. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Transport. <laughs> Uh, uh, Lucas, again, just a clarification here. Um, we detect lost packets, but we only transmit uh, data. So we don't retransmit packets. We retransmit the data that was lost, which could be reframed or repacketized or, or whatever. So this is what allows this. You could detect that a, an unreliable datagram was lost from the sender side, but you wouldn't retransmit it. Um, it. It's something that's different from other protocols like TCP or I think RTP will. Mm -hmm. but. Dana, did you intend to put your name in the queue? Uh, could you explain more about your integrity for uh, Yes. So the in, okay. So the current approach in the in the draft that we had so far with Jake was that we have integrity frame. So if you know MB, maybe so basically you have uh, you, you have checksums for each packet you transmit over multicast, and these checksums verify that the packets you get are actually sent by the server and not injected by a third party. So these integrity frames, the first one is sent over unicast, and then from there you can include them in the multicast packets, right? Because then you have like a Merkle tree and you each multicast packet received over multicast guarantees the integrity of the next one. Or, or you can do whatever you want, right? Like there's different schemes, it's up to the server to you know bundle some packets. And if you have like video segments, then you have like integrity depending on each other or something. But but that's the point. You have an frame, an integrity frame that has a bunch of checksums for packets. And these checksums, the, the client verifies that they match the, the packet, and then you 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 are sure that it's not injected, and you can safely use it. Right? That's the integrity. And the other approach is to have um, Luis going to talk about this in a bit. Actually, maybe you can do it now. Then so just next. Could, could you yeah. Explain yeah. Signature? Yes, he's yeah. going to do that. Yeah. I should explain it now, or just wait for the slides to, um, to show up after. I think now now if you ask, it's fine. You can explain now. Okay, so the, the other approach was like, it's two, two more actually. Lenny's got the slides. Next one, Lenny. Yeah, ah, then, yeah. yeah we're on. And another one, please. <laughs> yeah, so the, the other approach was a bit like uh, Alta, so the other draft. Um, so it's to have the digital, digital signatures, uh, either at the end of each quick packets or um, per object, if you could say. So for example, in quick, you have uh, the, this idea of streams. Um, when you can send a single object in a stream. So for example, in a video conference, you could say an I send an iframe per stream because you have, you have a lot of streams. And the idea would be to authenticate a stream as a whole um, because again, in this use case, you, you will send an iframe um, at the same time. So in multiple quick packets, and then you can authenticate the, the, the iframe as a whole. Um, and so you, you will have like digital signatures happened at the end of this, all the, all these streams and the, the clients will have just to, to authenticate once for a stream of multiple quick packets. Um, but yeah, it's costly to, to do the, the authentication. Were you considering doing a hash of a shared tree, uh, a shared um, key, or were you going to use RSA for signature? Uh, for, for currently, we use EDDSA. Um, but yes, okay. other algorithms could be used, of course. Francois. Yes, that's actually exactly one of the points where we're looking for feedback is on how to do integrity. Like you guys have more experienced deployment and like on large scale, what, what makes more sense there? Yeah, Francois. So uh, just uh, like a clar clarifying question about the integrity. So we were discussing about many to many connection that might be hard. Does the asymmetric signature enables a way to more easily do the many to many because might, you might not need to have like unicast channels in that case like my, my, maybe a, a simplified version of multicasts with no unicast channel only asymmetric signatures that might be heavy but that might allow many to many more easily right what do you think I'm not sure, but I think this is outside the scope of this run, right? Because for us, it's just one too many for, for quick. We have one server that serves the unicast connection and we have clients. We don't consider any many too many or anything like that. Okay, thank you. Julius uh, I'm, if you if you're going to say it later, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, how do you do key agreement, group key agreement? Over the unicast quick connection. Yeah, but using quote algorithm. Um, that can be negotiated like the rest of the, the quick crypto. Is there one you recommend? 
it depends <laughs> that depends a bit on what you want to do right we had the idea to even use algorithms that are weaker than the ones quick allows because they just save you know but and if you do video frames maybe you don't want you don't need that strong encryption but i couldn't recommend you one specifically right now. so are you going to put in an mti algorithm for key agreement we're probably just going to rely on what, what quick is doing we're not i think but of course you're welcome for feedback welcome if you have better ideas then we can talk. No, yeah. that's why I'm asking. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, Lenny's next. Lenny's in the queue. Go ahead, Lenny. Yeah, I, I would just, um, uh, just a, a plus one for SSM only, and I, I would really caution against, you know, adding lots and lots of complexity for to, to address many to many use cases. I, I think the, the the real, you know, value and need here is, is one to many, and, um, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd hate to see us kind of repeat some of the, maybe mistakes we've made in the past where we tried to do too many different things and, and um, uh, you know, created so much complexity and difficulty that things never got deployed. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason ASM has been deprecated for interdomain and even for intradomain, it is strongly recommended. Um, so I, I just want to uh, plus one on the SSM only approach. All right, Dino. Okay. It wasn't clear to me. Did, were you going to do Diffie Hellman over the unicast channels to, yes. to do key in negotiations? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. yeah. Versus just advertising the public key. Since you're doing ECDSA, you already have the key pair set up. So you think you just have to send the public key over and then the other side could just verify the signature that way. Have you thought about that? You or? can think about oh, that. Right? Okay. I don't yeah, sorry, I can uh, comment on that. So you, we have two, actually two layer, layers of, uh, of security. We have <clears throat> the encryption key that is used to, um, to protect the, the packets like it's done with Quick, yeah. and then we have the authentication. So you have already to, to, to share the key with the clients using the unicast channel, the key that is used to encrypt the data yeah. like normal Quick, uh, yeah. Quick does. And then, for example, if you use asymmetric signatures, you also have to advertise the, the public key um, that the client will use to authenticate the packets. So you have two layers. But if you, yeah, okay. But for the other method, for the the AMB style, uh, the the hashes are just sent over the unicast channel. So you don't have to advertise new key materials because you already have these unicast connections where you can send the the packet to digest digest uh, to the clients. The they don't. There's no public. You you negotiate the uh, the, the the hash algorithm and then you just send the hashes oh, for the packets. Yeah. I'll just echo it again. So what, what service do you actually want to offer? Real time or kind of a best effort? You know, we make it as slow as the slowest guy can receive something as long as we save uh, traffic, right? Because I think that design uh, impacts a lot of what we want to do here. The, the idea is that you have different channels, right? So you can what? have, the idea is you have different channels. So you don't, the, the server can like offer different frame, uh, like frame rates or whatever you want, like different bit rates. For if you have to, if you talk about video, for example, if, that, if I got your question correct, is that if the slowest client slows down everybody else, is that yeah? Essentially? So yeah, no, right. no, no. Okay, so you have different channels, right? So you you can even do things like layered video eventually, maybe, where you can have multiple multicast channels, and the client subscribes to whatever fits best for him. And if there's like a lot of slow clients, you just offer a new like the server can just create a new channel ad hoc, and then publish that channel and the clients, the slow clients can subscribe to that channel while the faster clients can watch whatever they want to watch. So um, do you, do you, have, have you looked into SVC in terms of, you know, subscribing to multiple layers in SVC because that's a subset question, right? So I think if that's the goal, well, we'll have to be very careful in whether this is actually something that Quick should do or some, you know, um, media over quick in terms of people who have an idea with that session layer management of, of things like these, these video codecs, right? I would, yes. I would see a lot of value in having a simple version that is really okay. this stupid, the slowest guy is fine. And if he gets too slow, we throw him out or something mm -hmm. like that, which is, I think, an, an, an interesting class of simple application. That to me would still be a transport protocol and going quick. Yeah. What you're saying here now to me would even mean likely a different working group, right? So, and both of them are good, right? So. The, the idea is that we, we in, the, in the draft itself, we keep it as unspecified as possible, right? So we don't say, we just say there's the possibility to have multiple channels. 
but what the the server eventually wants to do with that we don't say it has to do it like we propose like for media specific as we just say there can be more than one channel and clients can subscribe to more than one channel what happens that way or who decides what channel to subscribe to whatever we we want to yeah the same draft, yeah. The same application choice yeah, yeah I, I think you want to have at least if it's informational a validation draft going in parallel that yeah. gives an example of kind of the maybe most complicated stuff you really want mm -hmm. to do with it even if that doesn't get standardized initially but we need something to verify the, the multi-channel behavior again okay. yeah i think that's a good point yeah Luis, one more in the queue Luis. Mm -hmm. actually i'm just requesting the document <laughs> to be able to change the slides but it's okay uh, ah okay yeah yeah lenny um if we go back to slides now please then we can talk about the fact yeah i think we're done with the current yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so for FEC, so that's what change that we we added in the in the draft. It's to use FEC for, to recover from uh, lost packets, so that we can now send Reaper frames uh, on the multicast channel. So that now you can have different clients that have distant losses, and now with a single Reaper frame, you can just recover all the, the losses on these clients. So for this, we could rely on the on the draft from uh, François Michel, who is also in the room. Um, and actually, in the, one of the implementation already uses that and showed uh, good results. So the idea would be like, for example, if, if you want to protect the, the, tree, the stream frames that you send on the multicast channel, you can just encapsulate uh, these frames into a new frame that is called a, a source symbol frame. And now the source uh, can decide to send FEC uh, packets, uh, FEC frames. So in the draft, it's called uh, Reaper frames. And you compute uh, FEC uh, based on the, the source symbol you protect. And the two strategy would be either to send them proactively uh, or uh, based on feedback from the, from the clients. So either um, the cli or some clients lost a specific packets. Uh, and we see that several clients lost uh, multiple packets. The, the source can decide to send um, a Reaper frame on the multicast channel, or it can be uh, based on other things. It's not clear uh, yet, so if you have, you have any ideas, um, it could be interesting. Um, of course, we have also to manage, because it's at the transport layer, we have to manage uh, how we, we deal that with the condition control. Uh, there is already an uh, uh, RFC about that, about how we deal with, RF, uh, with FEC um, and the condition control, so that's something that we should include also in the discussion. Um, but that's maybe more related to, to quick and that's for this uh, group. So I'm going to ask you a question. This, uh, Greg, me, have you looked at the FEC framework that took place, gosh, 10 plus years ago now? The, the FEC framework, you see? Yeah, fam the working group FEC frame. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so it's not my expertise domain, but Francois worked a lot uh, on that. And, okay, um, and so I think the draft correctly uh, relates about the, this FEC um, uh, this fact framework. So right. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Uh, I don't know if you have any comment on that, Francois, but. Uh, Francois Michel, so yeah, I raised my hand in the queue so you can put it down. Um, so basically the quick FEC document is uh, what was done with the authors of the fact frame document. It's like relying on the same principles. We just changed a bit uh, the fields to make it more like uh, looking like the other uh, quick frames that we do. Basically, we use variants and that kind of stuff, oh, but it's yeah. still uh, like yeah. really generic uh, quick FEC design, allowing to use a lot of um, error correcting codes and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, it's basically relying on, on that previous design. Thanks. Uh, Jules? Uh, Julius Krabacek, just a clarifying question. Does can you do FEC for unreliable data too, or is it only for reliable data? Uh, you you could do that. So of course you just you just add a source symbol frame uh, in front of the frame that you want to protect. But sure. so then just it's a... to mention that FEC with unreliable data for certain application works beautifully well by reducing loss rates to mm -hmm. manageable. Yes, of course that's something that is really easy to to do. Of course, thank you, Corey. Very first. Um, the congestion control bit in quick fec is very terse. And what's the standard status of the thing we're talking about? I didn't check that. 
about this RFC? The, the, the current document we're talking about is proposed standard EXP. I, no, the, 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 the FEC thing is EXP, and it relies on something which is informational through its congestion control, which seems like a terrible down ref. And is, and is this, I mean, where are we going to say the congestion control? Because this seems like the tricky bit to get right. Which document? Uh, just if it's either just it was an idea uh, to to write on this document because it's a it's an informational document just to to clarify that we have to be careful when using FEC for the congestion control. But I don't think the current draft uh, uses this um, this document. But it's just because it's we we know that it has some importance to to include uh, congestion control debate when you use FEC because for example you cannot just add FEC without considering the congestion control okay. and also if you hide the losses from the congestion control. These losses are maybe congestion induced. So you cannot just say, okay, we recovered those losses, so it's not induced to congestion and we can just increase the congestion window. I think you got the hint of my um, comment. Okay. Figure out how to do it and put some musts in rather than shoulds where you need musts. And uh, let, let, let's, let, let's review that properly when we get to it. Sorry. Bitoshi. Torless. No, Bitoshi. So, do you consider the uh, differentiating the, uh, the encoding late because uh, you may have a lot of consumers, uh, you receivers, and who has a different condition, of course. So, um, someone want to encode out str strongly, and someone want to have a light encoding. So, how you can distinguish the, such kind of encoding rate for the multiple users? Um, that's a good question. We haven't thought about that, so we... Maybe this is a very important point for this one. Yeah, currently we just use a single uh, FEC layer per, per channel. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we could also like cluster the clients based on their uh, capacity to encode and decode data. Um, but currently it's not something that we have considered, so we'll have to okay. dig into that. Okay, so I, I do recommend to consider such kind yes. of situation. And also, if we consider such kind of situation, we also need to uh, distinguish maybe channel itself. So this kind of uh, rule, creating such kind of rule is also a okay. tough one. But anyway, it's an interesting thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think we can move to the next slide, please. Uh, yes, just a quick recap, but Max told about it uh, a lot, so we'll use uh, we had also something about multipass, quick, um, and Max already told uh, about the benefits of using multipass because now you can just, for a client, you can just sim seamlessly receive data over unicast instead of multipass. So um, we we don't break the, the the reception from for the clients using multipass. So that's really something that that is interesting, and also um, that's easier uh, the the implementation. But I think you covered. It. You covered it all, so we can move to the next slide. Maybe the only thing that you need is just encrypt Oh, yes, of course, yes. Sorry, previous slide, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, the last comment, which is really important indeed, um, is that currently Multipass uses the same crypto for all the passes um, inside the connection. But here, if you want to do that, we have to have a different crypto context for each uh, of the pass we use. Um, so it shouldn't be that complex to implement. Uh, but it's something that changes from the current uh, version of the draft about multipass. Yes. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so that's the question. The final question we had, which is also a very important question, is what do we do with integrity? So uh, we've discussed that already. Um, but you have, if you have any other comments, um, it could be very interesting. Currently, we so we'll speak about that a bit later. But we have. Uh, two visions for integrity, um, either the AMB, AMB style or using signatures, either per packet or per stream. Um, of course, using signatures is very costly. Uh, and currently, the authentication per stream can uh, bring uh, DOS attacks. So it's also something that is uh, really important to to, uh, to consider. And that's why we also wanted to, to discuss maybe a threat model that we have to, to find. Um, if we have spoofed packets, for example. Um, and yes, so you have a question, sorry. So in terms of the cost of signatures, were you planning on doing the signature over the entire packet? Because you could do it on a very short, part, small part, like 64 bits or whatever, and that would be sufficient. Do you still think it's expensive? 
Um, if I remember correctly, um, for example, if you do uh, EDDSA, you you will hash the packets and then you will have a you digest. Don't have, you don't have to. You could just, the signature data could be whatever the protocol chooses. So it could be made cheap. I don't know if it's real cheap, but I, it doesn't have to go through. It doesn't, you don't have, the signature data doesn't have to be a 1500 byte packet. Okay. I'm not an expert, uh, but in my in my head, it was like you hash the packet and then you do the signature, but you already have like a 64 digest and you have to use this digest to do the signature. And if you if you have a packet of 100 bytes or of uh, a thousand bytes, it doesn't change much because the hash will uh, is not very costly compared to the signature. So, um, but if we can find some signature algorithms that are cheaper, that could be very interesting uh, to consider. Um, and so the question we had with Max was, uh, should we just focus on a single method and then see how it works? Or um, should we provide both approaches in the, in the draft and in the implementations and then have some kind of, um, of uh, negotiation with the clients? Uh, so it has complexity, but for different use cases, it can be very interesting to, to have both approaches. So if any have any comments on that. Julius Krobacek, less options, please. OK. <laughs> OK, so at some point, we'll have to. That's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I can I continue. Or... OK. Um, so we have two reference implementations. Um, Max and Jake gave up on Chromium because it was a bit messy. Sorry. Uh, so now they're working with AOQuick, uh, and they have um, somewhat working implementation with all the frames and the transport parameters. Um, so that's really something that we can, that they can continue and to do uh, some demonstration at some point. Um, and we also have a Kish Cloudflare implementation, uh, which is not open source uh, currently, and it does FEC and negative acknowledgement. So we also have this, um, we can do this comparison uh, in the future, um, but it doesn't have a flow, flow and control condition um, mechanism. No, no. So to be honest, uh, I integrated the, the draft very recently, and uh, the Cloudflare Kish implementation uh, doesn't follow the draft uh, very much. So we have to do, do some work to make it, it interoperable. Uh, so that's something we have to do for the future. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the next step, we already discussed them a lot. Um, so I don't think we have to go further than that. Uh, we hope to be able to present this work uh, at the quick working group uh, in a, an IETF or two, uh, and have something that works to show uh, how we can, um, yes, how we can work. And just also a final comment, uh, since Max and me, we are PhD students, uh, we heard the comments uh, saying that we don't have clear use cases. And of course we don't have clear use cases because we are PhD students. So <laughs> if, you, if you have use cases that could um, direct us in a good direction, uh, of course, that could be a great idea. So don't, don't hesitate to, to reach out uh, for this. And I think it's the last slide. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Lucas? Thank you. Just, just very quickly as a quick chair. This was presented by Jake back in uh, Philadelphia last summer. Um, and this is all quick stuff. Right? We, we, quick's potentially the right venue for that. Obviously, I can't speak for the working group and who wants to adopt what. but. The, the quick features themselves probably belong there, but the discussions of multicast specific things, we know nothing about. So we really value the discussion here uh, and use cases too. You know, the, the quick working group would definitely need those use cases to uh, make the work worth doing. Uh, so I just, if people wanna speak to these chaps or us, like please do, because this will all be good. Uh, it's cool technology, but doing stuff because it's cool is like not good because we've all got limited time. We can do that at PhD students. <laughs> OK, cool, thanks. Okay, maybe one quick comment for Gori. The congestion control, right? That's one of the reasons why we want to take the, the C back forward, because the congestion control for multicast in general is really, really complicated. And with the fact draft, we, had, we, are, we are still debating if we, exactly what you mentioned, if we want to um, just say fact should be done, and then just that's it. And then however you do fact, then handle congestion control effect that's in a separate draft. Or if you want to go into details how to do the fact in this case with, with the, the draft from Francois. But yeah, CBAC, that's that's one of the reasons why I want to take CBAC forward. I think we think CBAC is going to be very relevant here, which is congestion, uh, circuit breaker, and assisted congestion. Yeah. Gory? Yeah. Gory, Gory. 
Hi, Corey. Trying to come back on that and say something helpful. Um, I think there is a problem with the number of brains you might require. So a separate draft could be at least something that maybe some congestion control people can get their heads around. Um, if you know the intersection of congestion control people and multicast aware people, they're probably one or two of the people in this room and nobody else. So be, be aware of that because we, we need to have good congestion control and I think that's absolutely vital to get that right. But expressing that in a, a document where it explains what it is you're trying to do and then pushing that to a group that understands congestion control might be more helpful. Okay. Just, a, just so a suggestion, yes. go no, no. whichever way you think is most useful. Sure, no. but Gord, is your expectation that the circuit breaking, the uh, congestion control, excuse me, would be in QUIC or, do, or the application using QUIC? Even that would be a good thing to write down. And how you deal with receiving multicast and unicast at the same time and switching between the two, like, uh, interesting problems and tr try and describe them. Well, just yes, okay. historically, is that the application layer? And is it just multicast, just UDP, right? So we've, the applications did the things like layered video, you know, and, and responses like this. So that still could, could take place using QUIC. Right. Except Quick is doing something underneath as well. So that's well could. <laughs> right. If you enable that and want want to use that, sure. But I was just wondering what your expectations were to see you know what we have in place would work or you're expecting something more. I think I need both cookies and coffee to be able to think about that. <laughs> um, I, I was motivating with, with a simple document that, that just even just tries to set your problem statement out. Sure. Maybe even you don't publish it because it goes, um, it goes into another document, but something so simple that you might be able to get the right feedback. And Toilus will probably tell you okay. the answer now. Go on. Yeah, for, for talking point, that'd be fantastic. All right, Toilus. So, sure. no, I, I, I think the problem is that we may have less on the basic uh, congestion control mechanisms documented in a way that it can help here uh, than we w wish to, right? I mean, we have a congestion control working group now that's slowly even trying to ramp up to where we were 20 years ago. Um, and uh, multicast had already, you know, uh, with RMT and others gone beyond that. But which of the RMT stuff can we actually use and refer to? FEC frame did FEC frames and tell us how to do congestion control with FEC loss, but not data loss. And so, I mean, that, that, that seems like a big blob by itself much of which, for example, the FEC stuff would even be valuable just for Unicast itself if it hasn't been done in FEC frame, right? So sure. it, this, this already, I mean, splitting up the work into multiple things, if, you know, beneficials should certainly be on the table before we finalize the adoptions. I, I remember at CCWG, there was even the question from Magnus and Lars, right, about if multicast should be at all relevant to CCWG or not. And maybe the answer is then yes, it should be. Sorry, yeah. yes. I can, <laughs> I can answer that one directly. Uh, not in the document that CCWG are producing currently. That okay. doesn't mean that there isn't latent expertise that could be applied to this document. Mm -hmm. It's just that guidance document isn't going to unwrap this kind of worms mm -hmm. and try and tell you. But if you okay. present the kind of worms, they might be able to give you a beauty judgment. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a clarification about your comments um, about congestion control with the with Unicast uh, um, fallback. Uh, so in MPEG Quick, if I remember correctly, you have a different congestion scale per pass. So you will have you will have this congestion control for the unicast pass between the server and the clients. And then the question now is just how do we find a good congestion control for the multicast pass? But it doesn't it doesn't influence the the how the the fallback the unicast fallback uh, will be handled uh, for the client. Maybe I think there could be some correlation, right? <laughs> Potentially, right? Because if you suddenly send a lot of traffic over unicast because you fall back from multicast, you need to then get you get congestion there. But yeah, I think they're not entirely unrelated, but yes, Corey. Yeah, right, right it down. Yes, okay, we will. Thank you. Um, I just thought of another potential problem. You, you never retransmit over multicast. We do. You do? Is there, is there a race condition <laughs> where you have to do duplicate packet detection on the receiver if it goes over unicast and multicast? Oh, okay, so I wasn't the, sure from... Yeah, the, the server would decide, depending on how many packets are lost, if the, the packets should be retransmitted over UDCast or Multicast. So it would never, I guess, transmit both at the same time. 
So if a lot of clients lose the same packet, then he would probably try even over a different unique uh, multicast channel to retransmit. Uh -huh. But if it's a single client that loses the packet, he would trans retransmit it over unicast. It's one sequence number space, so it could the receiver could detect duplicates, right? Yes. yes oh, okay. And, you, and I think that's a rare event, especially if you throw FEC in there, yeah. right? Okay. Anyone else? Thanks, everyone. Yeah, great discussion. Yes, Thank you guys very stuff. much for picking Thanks this up. <clears throat> Hey, but now all the fun's beginning. Where are you going? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Me eyes. Hello, uh, M.O.D. group. Um, I would like to talk about the efficiency of beer multicast in large networks. Uh, huh? Next slide, please. Yeah. Oh, that doesn't do it. Yeah. So, uh, why beer, or why do we uh, consider the performance or the efficiency of beer in large, multi in, in large networks? Um, well, with IP multicast, what, what, is the, what is the motivation for beer first? In IP multicast networks, we have state and core nodes for multicast groups, and we also have signaling overhead per multicast oh, group. Right. Per multicast group. And uh, there is also severe signaling load in case of linger node failures due to reconvergence. And uh, if we, and ITF's answer to these problems is a bit index explicit replication. Here we define a, uh, the, a beer domain and uh, ingress nodes, so called uh, bit forwarding ingress routers, add a beer header with a bit string on the, on, on the packets. And this bit string encodes potential receivers. Those receivers are called bit forwarding egress routers. Each bit position corresponds to one uh, bit forwarding egress router, so one receiver. The packet is deli deli delivered to a specific receiver if that bit in the bit string is set to one, and thereby uh, the core remains free of any states, and uh, also signaling is not needed for core routers. That means core nodes, the bit forward, forwarding, the beer forwarding nodes, um, forward and replicate the packets only according to the beer header to the bit string and according to the routing underlay. So th this is how beer works. Next slide, please. Um, what if, if there are more bit forwarding egress routers than we have bits in the bit string? So for instance, we have 1,024 bit, uh, potential receivers, but the bit string is only 256 bits long. Then we need uh, not only a single bit string, we need four different bit strings, and each of these bit strings needs to have a number, and this is the set identifier. So basically, we uh, divide the, the uh, potential receivers within a beer domain into sets, and each of these sets requires uh, an own copy of the of the multicast packet. Yeah? If there is a if there is a receiver in one of these sets, then we need one uh, specific copy of the multicast uh, packet towards that set. Um, and um, if you make four multicast packets out of one, this is of course overhead. Now we ask ourselves, how many packets are required from the sender? Well, if we do IP multicast, then we need only a single packet. And if we, and if we do unicast for application layer uh, unic, uh, multicast, then we need a packet for every receiver. So um, that's how it scales. And what about beer? Well, it depends. With beer, the number quickly approaches uh, to the number of set identifiers or sets that we have in the beer domain with an increasing number of receivers. Here on this uh, figure, you see on the x-axis the number of receivers, and on the y-axis, you see the number of beer packets required. And uh, this depends on the number of uh, sets that you have in the beer domain. So um, if we have one 
your domain, if we have only one set, we need only a single packet. If we have two sets and we send like five, uh, uh, and we have like five receivers, we quickly need uh, two, pack, uh, two packets from the sender, on, um, that is uh, statistically. And uh, if we have four or eight um, sets, then when we send 10 packets or 15 packets, then we already also need four or eight uh, packets. So very quickly, we really need the number of packets uh, that is also the number of uh, sets in the beer domain. Next slide, please. I, I'm trying to raise my hand. I can't get in this queue for some reason. I, I just want to point out that um, this is describing a worst case scenario. No, this is a statistical scenario. No, it's, it's clearly you, you stop at 256 bit uh, mask and we can do bigger that in beer. Beer defines larger oh, yeah. than that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your assumption is that the membership immediately is spread across the multiple sets, exactly. which again is the exactly, worst case yeah. scenario of it all. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we did. We, we assume that this is purely random, and in reality, oh, probably okay. we do sure. not have uh, yeah. this randomness. Uh, so uh, this, yeah. this, this is correct. Sure. So, but what about the sets? Uh, links may carry multiple copies copies of multicast packets. And um, this also depends on the way we choose these sets. Um, on the left side of the figure, you, you see a set that uh, two sets that are not so well chosen. And if you count the number of packets that are needed to uh, reach all the receivers, it's 24 hops. And on the right side, you see well chosen uh, sets. And if you count here the number of uh, packets needed, it's only 16 hops. So there's one challenge, choose the right sets within a beer domain. Next slide, please. Uh, to do that, we came up with a very simplistic traffic model. Namely, every node within a beer domain sends one multicast packet to all other nodes. Okay nothing realistic, but it's just an assumption to do some calculations. And the performance metric is we count the overall number of uh, per hop packet transmissions, and that is what we want to reduce by a good clustering. So we came up with three different mod uh, methods to create the sets in uh, the partitioning basically in a, in a beer domain. The first is random assignment of nodes to sets, and this is obviously not such a good idea. The second is an integer linear program to obtain the best theoretic solution. Um, actually, it's a great idea, but it does not scale. Yeah? With this approach, you can, you can optimize maybe uh, uh, networks up to 128 nodes, but uh, any larger networks, that's more than difficult. And uh, finally, we also developed a fast heuristic algorithm that covers large networks up to 10,000 nodes. And here is a, a comparison uh, on small problem instances so that we get an idea whether this um, fast heuristic algorithm is, yields good results or not so good results. So we consider different topologies, uh, mesh topologies with a node degree of two on average, with four, with six, and with eight. And the networks, the network sizes are 64 and uh, 128 uh, nodes. The number of sets that we have is two or four respectively. And 100% uh, is the load that we get with the integer linear program as a method to uh, cluster the, the, the nodes within a beer domain. And with the heuristic, uh, we got a, a load of uh, around 101%. So the heuristic algorithm was only 1% worse than the optimal algorithm. When you look at the random assignment, then we easily get uh, additional loads of 30 up to 80% more, which is obviously not so good. So comparing the heuristic and the random algorithm shows us that the random algorithm works pretty well. And uh, why do I tell you that? In the remainder of this work, we need to cluster the 
that the beer domains. And for that, we utilize the heuristic algorithm because we look at large networks and the optimal algorithm does not scale towards these large networks, but the algorithm is pretty good. Next slide, please. Uh, yes, this one. So um, we consider the following experiment. We use a bit string size of 256 bits, and we look at networks with different topologies and different number of nodes. And the receiver and um, the traffic model is that every node sends one packet to all other nodes. Uh, we clustered the network into optimal sets so that we have uh, yeah, the best performance we could get from beer. And the results are the following. Uh, if you look at the figures on the x-axis, you have the number of nodes, so that is the network size. And on the y-axis, you have the relative overall traffic. So on the left side, that is beer versus IPMC. That means if you have uh, a value of two, that means in a beer network, you will, uh, you will see twice as much overall network load as, it, as with uh, IPMC. And we see now very different curves. We, the orange and the green curve, those are line and ring networks. Yeah? Those are very special. And on lines and, and rings, um, beer has a bad performance compared to IPMC. And when we look at, uh, at binary trees or mesh networks with a node degree of two, then this is the bottom line. Uh, so there, beer and, um, and IPMC have a very similar overall network load. And in between, we see mesh networks with a node degree of four, six, and eight. So this is a line, a rising line somewhere between one and two. And on the right axis, uh, on the right figure, there is a comparison between beer and unicast. And here we see, although beer has a clearly worse performance than IPMC, uh, beer can drastically reduce the the overall network load uh, with regard to um, uh, when we look at line and ring networks. So uh, although beer is much worse than IPMC, it is so much better than, uh, than application layer unicast. And uh, for ring and uh, for binary trees and for mesh networks with a no degree of two, we also see a large a reduction in load, like 90% or so. Next slide, please. Lenny? Lenny? Okay, maybe he fell asleep. Nope, we got a page. There we go. We gotta, let's do the question. Yeah, please, Jules. Uh, if you could, could you please come back to the previous slide? So, uh, I mean, I agree with your conclusion, but I think I could be wrong that line is not actually the worst case on the left-hand side, that the worst case would be a line that branches at the end with all the receivers at the very end, and mm -hmm. then the value would be twice that. I'm just yep. commenting that this, is the, this yep. gives the impression that line is the worst case, but the worst case is actually twice that, could, which doesn't contradict could, your Could conclusion. be even worse, but we considered our, uh, we limited our, um, consideration of the performance to very general structures, not to special st structures. So we looked at lines, links, and uh, meshed uh, networks with a configurable node degree. And this is also a question, what, what topologies are really typical for multicast networks, but we can discuss that later. Next uh, slide, please. Um, what about small multicast groups? Because before I, I just considered uh, full, mul uh, full multicast groups, every node sends a packet to every other node. And here in this uh, experiment, we considered uh, bit strings of 256 bits and a network size of 1,024 nodes. And uh, when you look at the figures on the x-axis, you see the number of receivers. On the y-axis, you see the relative overall 
no uh, tra uh, overall traffic when we compare IPMC versus unicast. So the more receivers we have, the better is the compression rate or the, 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 the overall load reduction of IPMC versus unicast. We, of course, we see the same behavior for beer versus unicast, but what's interesting is a comparison of the load generated by beer and the load generated by IP multicast. And we see here, okay, for line and ring, uh, beer is clearly worse than uh, IPMC. Uh, and for the more hierarchical network structures like um, a binary tree and uh, a sparse mesh, the relative overall traffic first rises, then it uh, decreases again. So that means especially um, small trees are really bad for beer because uh, there is this large overhead. As soon as we have uh, multiple sets, uh, it is quite likely that uh, beer needs to send um, several packets, nam namely one to each of the sets, and that that generates a lot, um, a relatively lots of overhead compared to what you could have. Just, Greg, um, raise my hand a bit. Again, uh, going back to the descriptors, I, I mean, great information, I appreciate this, um, but I, when you have a, a comment that says, effective as a beer suffers, especially for small multicast groups, you're missing a lot of information on what you've actually tested there because yeah. small group could be one set and that's it, optimum efficiency. So really when you have a small group over a large network with many sets randomly yeah. distributed, we need to be careful with that um, so that you know, people don't come away thinking beer can't do something. Like, no, you've misconfigured your network to make beer work as poorly as right. possible. So from, from, from this investigation, I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't uh, conclude so much about uh, the performance of, with small multicast trees because when, when you look at real networks or real multicast trees, there is some correlation about the receivers and there is uh, probably Region. probably it's more likely that multiple receivers reside in the same set uh, if you do yeah. the clustering right but um, but we see a tendency here at least uh, yeah well we this is um work never got published with, i played with a long time ago my gosh right when we started rolling out beer this idea of uh, dynamic bit assignment getting some awareness of your edges, getting aware of, of your distribution. Like for example, if you've got a national backbone and the sun comes mm -hmm. up in the East coast and the receivers are over there first, you know, and as stuff moves, you can kind of reassign bits or sets assignments so that you can keep your clusters as tight as possible and optimize your flow. Yeah. We really need to look at a uh, more realistic uh, uh, receiver distribution to make this, uh, yes. this right. work more realistic, realistic. Dino. Okay. I, I just had a quick mm -hmm. question to Shep. Um, if the network was really sparse um, on the order of less than one set, why would you have multiple sets? You, Just because you, it's no, misconfigured? The, potentially. Yeah, but what I was saying, when you say it says a small multicast group doesn't define the actual condition that they have the problem in, mm -hmm. right? Small group, one set's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Small group over a large network with many sets that are poorly distributed, that's bad. Why yeah. would you have many sets? Because it's greater than the set size. Well, you, you could have an application. It's not most networks run more than one application. Yeah. Right. So some applications maybe need all that stuff, some don't. And in, in, on that network, an application with a small number of receivers, however, spread across multiple sets for large topology, that's what they're showing here. Uh, um, okay. I, I, I'll take it offline. All right. So next slide, please. So this is another comparison, namely it's the load on the central links. Uh, in, in this experiment, we have again considered a, beer string, a bit string of 256 bits and a network size, size of 1,024 nodes. And now again, every node sends a packet to all other nodes. The metric is the number of overall, the, the overall number of packets on all the links. And uh, we consider now the complementary cumulative distribution function of the link loads. What is this? When you look at the figures, you see on the x-axis the link load in, in terms of number of packets that we see on these links. And uh, on the y-axis, you see the percentage of links that carry a link load larger than L. 
So the further we go to the right, the more is the load on individual links. And um, on the unicast uh, figure, we see that many of these lines end in the range between 2 to the power of 14 and uh, up to 2 to, to the power of 18. That is the number of packets we see on the most loaded links. And when we look at IPMC and carry out the same experiment, then we see on those links only a load between 2 to the power of 8 up to 2 to the power of 10 packets. And, we do the, and if we do the same experiment with beer, it's uh, about 2 to the power of 9 up to 2 to the power of 11. So it's about double the load, although we have four although we have four uh, sets instead, instead of just a single set. Yeah? But uh, it's not that the number of sets multiplies the traffic on the, on the most loaded links. So the, num the, the, the load on the most loaded links uh, does not scale with the number of sets in the network if you do the clustering right. Uh, that means both IPMC and BEER effectively reduce the load on the most loaded links. Next slide, please. Another question is, what is the best bit string size? Uh, why, why is this question in, of, of interest? Well, there's an obvious trade-off. If we have a large bit string, then we need to send only a very few packets, but the beer header is larger, and this, beer, and this bit string needs to be carried with every packet. And if if we use small bit strings, then we need many subsets, and uh, but the beer header is smaller. And the question is, where is the where is the sweet spot? Is there a sweet spot, and where is it? What's the optimal bit string size? In this in this experiment, we uh, considered a very large network, uh, more than eight thousand nodes, and a packet size with five hundred bytes payload. Uh, an IPMC header and a beer header. And again, every node sends a packet to all other nodes. And now the metric is not the number of overall packets, it's the overall traffic, because we also take the, packet, the, the header size into account. And what we see here now is on the, on the, on the x-axis, that is the bit string size, and on the y-axis, it's the absolute overall traffic that we, uh, that we evaluated, that we uh, got as a result. When we consider line and uh, ring networks, then the overall traffic decreases with an increasing bit string size, and there is some sweet spot uh, around 4,000K. Uh, if you have 4,000K as the size of a bit string uh, and make it even larger than the overall traffic increases again a little bit, but uh, not drastically. Yeah? So, but if we consider uh, other network topologies like uh, mesh networks, uh, mesh two or mesh four or binary trees, then we see a relatively flat curve and uh, we can conclude that uh, a bit string size of 256 bits is quite good for all these topologies. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, what about forwarding in failure cases? Uh, why is this question interesting? Well, um, when you remember how we clustered the beer domain, we took the, we, we took the full network uh, without any failures, and uh, we optimized the clusters for that routing. And in failure cases, the traffic may be deviated to somewhere else, uh, not as we pre-configured it. And the interesting question is, what happens then? Is the clustering then uh, a disaster, uh, so that you end up with four, double the traffic or four times the traffic? And uh, the, the the answer is it depends. So we, we conducted the following experiment. We considered a network size of 1,024 nodes, 
a bit string of 256 bits, and every node sends a packet to all other nodes. And we checked the routing for all single link failures. The metric of interest is the maximum load increase on any link in any failure case. And um, we considered only the only resilient topologies that by, that's why you do not see any line here. A line is not a resilient topology. What do we see here on the figure? On the x-axis, you see the maximum load increase in terms of packets on the link in a failure case uh, compared to uh, the load that the link carries uh, in a non-failure case, in the non-failure case. And on the y-axis, you see the percentage of links that have a maximum load increase larger than i, larger than the number of packets. The solid line is the load increase that you get with beer, and the dotted line is the load increase that you get with IPMC. Because this is not a beer problem, this is a general problem. If, um, if you have a failure in a network, traffic is rerouted, takes a longer path, or at least the path, that it, uh, the, or at least the, 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 the backup path is on another link that has to carry additional traffic. So this is both, uh, this is a general problem and not beer specific. And in fact, we see that the load increase for IPMC and for beer is very, very similar if we look at the mesh networks. And only in the very, say, pathologic, pathologic um, scenario of a ring, there we see a large, use, uh, a large uh, load increase for beer. Why do we see that? Well, as we remember, we have 1,024 nodes, bit string of 256. So we have four subsets, four packets are sent. And if there is a failure on the ring, then you need to send all the four packets to the left because on the right there's the there is the failure and this doubles basically the load on many links but well i would say the ring here is rather a pathologic uh, case you shouldn't yeah you probably shouldn't use beer on rings uh, next slide please and um, if you could wrap up because we're running out of time here so open issues and next steps. Uh, I'd, I, I'd really appreciate uh, input for more realistic evaluations. What topologies are realistic and what are typical multicast group sizes? And also correlations of multicast groups and um, topologies. What about small multicast groups in large networks? How do, how do they typically look like or how how large are those uh, multicast groups and um, this is particularly of interest because multiple beer packets are needed for receivers in different sets and there are also new kits on the block namely explicit tree structures in packet in packet headers that combine beer and segment routing ideas that we will talk about uh, tomorrow in the beer sec in, in the beer working group next slide please so this is the conclusion. Um, beer requires sets of for scaling to large networks. And that also means that we need to one packet per set that has a receiver. And uh, we developed for this problem a fast heuristic so that we can cluster the beer domains into such sets. Uh, in our performance comparison, uh, we compared beer with IPNC and unicast and considered uh, the number of packets from a sender, the overall network load, the load on most loads and links, and uh, potential load increase in failure cases. Um, bit strings with 256 bits are good enough for most network topologies, and exceptions are ling and, uh, lines and rings, and there may be also some issues with small multicast groups in very large networks. Uh, if you want to read a paper, uh, this has been accepted for I2B transactions on network and service management, uh, and it's available on early access, or uh, here is also a preprint on my website. Thank you. Any more questions? All right, great. Thanks. Lenny, take over. we got six minutes left with a five-minute presentation, so 
think we can do it. Great, thanks. Um, so this is just a, a very quick update on the treaty end draft, which is progressing in the MOPS working group. Um, so in terms of what is, you know, the, the, the problem that treaty end is trying to solve, and it's, it's really that um, audience sizes uh, are now in the tens of millions, um, somewhat commonly uh, for, for uh, live streaming events, um, combine that with bit rates. Um, suggests that maybe we're at an inflection point for network resources consumed by live streaming. Um, last year, it was Thursday Night Football on Amazon. Um, it was the first, the first time that NFL football was, um, uh, American football, was uh, streamed exclusively uh, over the internet. And they saw um, audience sizes of about 10 to, million, 10 to 15 million viewers every Thursday night, 16 nights a week uh, a year. <clears throat> um, this year, NFL Sunday Ticket uh, is um, that's that's pretty much all out of market. Uh, American football games are uh, exclusively streamed for the first time ever. And um, earlier, uh, early this summer, uh, for the cricket IPL final, uh, they announced 32 million uh, concurrent uh, viewers, um, concurrent streams. Um, I believe that was uh that's believed to have been the largest number of concurrent streams so um th the other thing to keep in mind is live streaming is not the same as on demand um primarily for the latency budget uh for to match um traditional broadcast television it, it should be about 10 seconds um uh compared to uh 10 seconds um from actual live occurrence um otherwise you you run the risk of hearing, uh, you, you can't have one and two minute playoff buffers because you, you run the risk of, um, you know, getting a text message from a friend about the game winning score. Um, also join rates are vastly different. They're not smooth and predictable, um, like normal, uh, on demand traffic. Um, it's, it's more of like a step function as everybody tunes in just as the game's starting and everybody's tuning out once it's over. The other thing is, um, uh, the, the goal of, you know, I've, I've, I've mentioned some of these events. Um, the goal has generally been, can it be um, from, a, from a viewing standpoint, a viewing experience standpoint, uh, the goal has generally been uh, to be almost as good as what television has delivered for the last six, you know, 70 years in terms of reliability. Um, wouldn't it be better to, you know, uh, um, uh, Amazon Prime, with with all their resources, with all the CDNs that they've thrown at it, and I, I believe they they announced something like five different CDNs they were using, um, still are not they're not offering the games in 4K, uh, for example. Um, now here's a question: What what if you wanted to have an immersive experience, um, you know, that AR experience where you could throw on goggles and feel what it's like to sit at a game? Uh, look to your left of you, look to your right of you, feel what it's like to, to be in, you know, in the crowd as opposed to just a, you know, a traditional um, screen of high def or, or maybe even 4K. Question is, could this experience, uh, is it possible over the internet, um, over today's internet with say, you know, a, 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 few, a million viewers um, of that kind of high bandwidth experience? Um, so, uh, what treaty end is so network based replication. Uh, it's been fairly successful in some places, incredibly successful in some places, like financials and video distribution networks. Less so over the end bone, right? And that's that's why we're all here. So, um, you know, we, we've we've talked about the, the problems of internet multicast, kind of beaten, um, uh, in, you know, beaten um, that that dead horse has been beaten many times uh, in this working group, but. You know, kind of the three biggest issues are, you know, the all or nothing problem, the, the complexity problem, the chicken and egg. Um, there are now tools and technologies um, that uh, solve uh, and address all three of these issues. And that's what TreatyN is. Um, it is nothing new. There's no new protocols. It's actually the synthesis of existing well-known, well-understood protocols. Uh, it's really two components. There's the native component, and that is supported by SSM, generally speaking, PIM SSM, but could be anything that delivers SSM, MLBP, GTM, beer, um, BGP, MVPN, TreeSid, you name it. Um, we are not uh, uh, discriminating um, as long as it uh, supports SSM, um, that, that can be used. 
uh, and then um, combined with overlay technologies. Um, AMT is, uh, you know, the typical solution there, uh, but it could be anything else like, um, like say, uh, Lisp. Um, and this combination of, you know, with AMT on the overlay, it delivers a service. It is uh, not, the goal is not, you know, purity, um, technology, technological purity of, you know, pure native multicast. It's let's get packets to a bunch of receivers. Uh, and we don't care how that happens. Um, as I mentioned, this is a draft in um, the MOPS working group. Um, it is, uh, we've requested a working group last call. Um, it's been progressing well uh, and quickly um, and input and feedback. I'm, I share this with this working group because um, this, this working group along with PIM uh, has a lot of expertise um, in deployment and protocols that uh, would be um, likely very uh, valuable. Um, so this is just kind of a, a pictural view. Um, you know, you have the big eye internet uh, that is mostly unicast only. You have a tree DN provider that is native. Uh, and for off net receivers, those are receivers that are on a unicast only network. Um, you use overlay technologies like AMT to deliver that content. Um, this is not intended to replace CDNs, but actually this is a new CDN model. So, you know, if you think about how CDNs work without multicast, um, unicast traditional CDNs, you send traffic to CDN boxes, which are usually racks of x86 servers, um, and they they um, they send it to each other, and then they handle each uh, unicast replication. Um, tree DN is CDNs, you know, tree-based CDNs, um, and they're leveraging multicast. Uh, and the nice part about this is we rename those CDN boxes. We call them AMT relays, and if those AMT relays are um, are uh, existing routers that support AMT, uh, essentially, you know, you just configure a couple lines of config in the router as opposed to racking and stacking and powering and cooling and uh, a bunch of x86 servers that need to be plugged into routers. So it's arguably zero CapEx. Um, use cases, anything multi-destination, I've talked mostly about streaming video, but OS updates um, are, are another uh, less sexy, but really important use case. And the benefits are, you know, more efficient network utilization um, gets more out of the network. Not only does it support existing content like the, 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 the things I mentioned earlier, but also uh, makes possible new content, things like live streaming AR that uh, I would argue, you know, I, I would wonder aloud if, if Amazon with all their resources can't even do 4K, you know, think about um, uh, AR. Um, so this really enables new technology from new, con new content from new sources. Um, much greener uh, and more sustainable solution because, again, you don't need racks and stacks. You know, you can essentially do a CDN um, on a chip. It, this enables service providers uh, to offer replication as a service, um, again, at, at, uh, at, at far less cost, an order of magnitude cheaper to deliver the service because it's a much simpler model. And it also is a democratizing and decentralized solution. It gets back to the decentralized nature of the internet. Um, because is it healthy for the internet and society that only a small handful of companies control uh, all, just about all distribution of content? Um, so again, crossing supply and demand curves. Demand is, uh, is exploding for multi-destination traffic with you know, these audience sizes of the tens of millions combined with high bit rates. Um, and on the, on the supply side, uh, it's never been cheaper and easier to deliver uh, multicast services. So that's what TreeDN is. This is the draft. Um, and I would um, uh, request folks uh, check out the draft, uh, provide input. Um, there will probably be, hopefully, be a working group last call in MOPS very soon. Uh, and um, you know, if, if, if you're on that working group uh, list, please, please do comment if you think there's value there. Um, I've, I've asked them to actually copy uh, include uh, PIM and, and, and Bone D because I think um, in, in the working group last call, but uh, we'll see, hopefully that happens. But um, anyway, uh, just, a, just a quick update and um, you know, uh, input from this working group would be valued. That's it for me. I'll take any questions if there are any. I see none. Okay. So everyone use the app. Log yourself in so we have a head count. It's an important part of our getting a room size next time. Nods. We're just so engaged. Goodness, you had lunch and now it's nap time, right? I understand.
Um, Stig, fire those off when you get them. Appreciate it. And I do owe you, I promise. Um, unless something tragic happens to me before I can pay you back, that wouldn't be my fault. All right, don't hold it against me. All right, uh, thanks everybody. Last of our content. Have a great last two days in Prague if you're sticking around. And hopefully I'll see you guys in beer tomorrow. Uh, Lenny, you still on the, on the call? I am. Uh, I just want to point out something else with the <laughs> comparing CDN uh, is that it's you have to maximize your expenses and for potential capacity, whether the content you know receivers are there or not, and your mm -hmm. your ceiling is your CDN capacity. Whereas multicast, your bandwidth is already there. You don't have to preposition content or preposition resources to be prepared because you already have a network, and your ceiling is your network capacity and not how much CDN capacity you have. So I always yeah. call it like you know, so it's uh, sorry. It was like worst case scenario. Let me buy all the stuff and, and provision it all in the hopes that somebody's going to use it. And you still have a cap, right? Um, and then in the deployment too, you've got more router ports because you have all this equipment that has to be on the network as opposed to just your cross link, cross connects, and off to your edge. Anyway, right. You yeah. So, so essentially, but I, these are like I've, I've fired these buttons off. Back. Ooh, he told us not to do that. <laughs> we were told not to touch the camera. No, then he told us not to put it back. <laughs> no, 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 leave it alone. He says they have to they have to precisely align it so they can get stuff right. Exactly. No, it's no fault. I mean I, I asked for help and we did it. Um, I think you know he was doing on me. Yeah, yeah, yeah.